Dave Herndon, How to Tell Your Story, and it's subtitled Tips from a Recovering Magazine Editor. This is Episode 6 on What Has My Attention, and if you want to be a better writer, this episode is definitely for you. My guest Dave Herndon is an accomplished nonfiction editor and writer with nearly 40 years of experience at quality newspapers and magazines. We asked him for a few writing tips. I definitely want to become a better writer. And these tips turned out to be really great advice for delivering information and storytelling, regardless of the medium or platform. And Dave talks a lot and stresses the importance of using outlines. So all of the show notes include everything we talked about with links, which can be found at whathasmyattention.com for episode six. Identity is such an elusive concept. You know, it sure is. What you, how you want to put yourself out there. I guess that's the whole uh, sort of branding uh, piece of the yeah. puzzle is to be yeah. like, okay, I, I'm a million different things or nothing, depending how far down you want to go down the the yeah. self non self rabbit hole. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm an aggregate of you know simultaneously arising phenomena um <laughs> yeah so just to be clear we're recording and i want to okay. welcome everyone back to what has my attention and honestly uh dave has my attention in a very big way and so we're titling this episode how to tell your story and it's tips from a recovering magazine editor and yeah. that would be my guest today dave herndon great to be with you john yeah. Um, yeah. Recovering magazine editor. It's. It's. I'll probably never really get over it, um, because the. You know. It's. That's been part of my entire mindset and um, career and personality. Mm -hmm. Somebody who um, was fortunate to uh, pursue my sort of what a lot of people would consider leisure interests and turn them into professional activities. Oh, so wonderful. my first job I ever had was as a sports editor, mm -hmm. and it was at my favorite paper at the time, which was the Village Voice. So that was a um, unusual <laughs> well, combination it, of passions. It, yeah, but the doesn't the Village <laughs> Voice? I mean, that's just that's total recognition. I mean, back in the day, you know, people were reading the Village Voice, right? Oh, I I, li I lived and breathed it all through my sort of you know college years mm -hmm. and then what I, made it what made it so unique the uh really the the combination of the uh extremely talented and outspoken uh writers that they had mm -hmm. covering um politics national politics international politics local new york politics and then all the, you know all the culture of new york with a down downtown slant Mm -hmm. So uh, when I was, the you know, in college, you know, the punk was happening. And, you know, when I got to The Voice, then hip hop and rap started happening. Other things like performance art were very important part of the cultural diet in those days because of transgressive performers like the NEA5. I don't know if that rings a bell for you, but it performers doesn't. that had NEA funding, but that were kind of transgressive performers and then conservative um, uh, people tried to, you know, quash their NEA funding and, and sort of delegitimize the whole idea of federal arts funding based on that they didn't like certain performance artists called the NEA five. Um, mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. and you know, so anyway, in those days there was no membrane between my personal interests and my, uh, my job. Um, you know, I've always been a very active music listener. And, uh, one of the things I've done in addition to like sports writing is music writing and, um, the music coverage of The Voice was kind of this, really the kind of the standard bearer uh, in those days for, you know, um, all, all different kinds of music. Um, and, you know, so the kind of combination of cultural, culture, politics, New York stuff, and then these outsized writer personalities, you know, wandering around and picking fights in print and being very uh, outspoken and 
it's just you know highly charged yeah so, and it sounds yeah. like really rich fertile ground for a writer it was it was great and the you know the level of talent and the uh, the seriousness with which people approached uh, you know expressing themselves in print uh, mm-hmm. it was very high level um, mm-hmm. you know granular editing process where you'd sit there with the writer at the computer keyboard and go over every word choice every sentence every line and really? you know yeah so that's that's a kind of a practice that saw me through the rest of my career I tried to maintain that level of uh, you know attention and and focus and uh, on and, and collaboration with writers and editors um, is there, so it was great training is it, ground is there any other magazine or paper out there that is even close to an equivalent of that of the village voice now yeah. No. I mean, I, not that I'm aware of. The alternative press mm-hmm. has has uh, mm, sure. has succumbed to market and cultural forces. Um, so there's, it's a, you know, there are maybe a few alternative papers left, mm-hmm. but not many. And the ones that are there are suffering badly, or even mm-hmm. going out of business because of the economic impact of the, you know, coronavirus. Because you know, people aren't going to, you know, aren't going to see gigs and aren't going to restaurants yeah, and aren't going, yeah. you know, so the advertising base is pretty well gutted, you know. So I'm a journalist, I'm a storyteller, and I'm somebody that has been able to uh, pursue my private, and it's like, like I said, some what leisure interests. So the other the other thing, you know, I was, uh, I've been a travel editor and travel writer for a long time. And travel is a very big umbrella. Um, you know, you can talk about culture and all of its manifestations. You know, cuisine and um, nat- nat- natural attractions, and um, you know, on and on and on. Uh, ob- obviously, hospitality and tourism are part of that too. Um, but it's a great literary field too. So, so that's that was the meat and potatoes of my, you know, editing writing career yeah well I, I'll tell you since meeting you much of my view uh, you know much of my view has changed and it's actually people like you that have like um, went yeah I think I'm gonna stop spending so much time or even get off social media because there's just no craft in it I don't well there may be a craft in it but it's not a craft I'm interested in <laughs> <laughs> well it's for someone like me it's useful I'm also a news hound, so it's useful to keep up with uh, the, the people who are reporting news because they'll break it first on Twitter, um, mm-hmm. and um, and then it's also useful because those same people or other whoever you pick for your t- Twitter feed will link you to articles that might be well more well crafted than a tweet. Mm-hmm. You know, with all that said, I don't bother to tweet myself because I don't want to. Just don't like the whole. I, I don't like the way it feels. Um, yeah. Well, I, I still have a Twitter like account. I'm not real active on it, but uh, but since getting off Facebook and now reading the New York Times, which has been great, Twitter seems to be a place where a lot of journalists do spend time. So yeah, they do. That's it's almost an essential piece of their toolkit and their own personal branding, and their and they're also their you know representation of their um, employers. So mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. it's become a real controversial space for the same mm-hmm. very same reason but hey, that's a rabbit hole we don't need to go down right now yeah is there anything else you want to say about uh, recovering as a uh, magazine editor well like any history at all uh well you know i look i like i said i was you know pretty fortunate to have a good long run of a career doing stuff that i was personally interested in i've never i've never i can honestly say i never had a job that was for a publication that I really, you know, w- wouldn't read, with mm-hmm. the possible exception of Martha Stewart Living, <laughs> <laughs> and, and a and, and a stint at Sports Afield that was a pretty wild episode for everybody concerned. But uh, <laughs> Sports Afield, <laughs> um, yeah, we a friend of mine was hired to try to rescue Sports Afield from oblivion um at some point and um he his plan was to eliminate the hunting 
from sports afield, which did not go down well <laughs> with <laughs> what remained of the the core readership of sports afield. We, you know, and he tried to make it a little more of an outdoorsman's magazine that wasn't about hunting. Fishing, yes, we did, and but you know we started doing stuff like mountain biking, and you know, sort of a every man's um, outside magazine was kind of the way we. Sounds like you should have started a new magazine. Well, yeah, but that was, you know, at that time, Hearst uh, owned Sports Afield, and uh, they were, Hmm. you know, flailing and trying to, you know, make it justify itself economically. They wound up. Uh, pulling the plug and selling it <laughs> no, yeah, <laughs> that experiment yeah, yeah. did not work but boy did we have fun while we were doing it we, it was kind of a gonzo take that um <laughs> you know didn't take but we yeah. had fun for about a year and a half so <laughs> so now i'm using my uh writing and editing toolkit which i developed over you know the course of over 40 years of you know, high quality education and, you know, experience at a pretty high level with a lot of great colleagues. Well, now I'm helping people write their books and coaching, coaching, writer, co- coaching writers and editing, you know, books and marketing material for a couple of clients. And so that's, you know, there's still people want to write and there's still, there still are platforms, um, especially for people who own their own platforms or don't mind, self-publishing or whatever Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um so that's where that's where i'm at right now um in terms of you know that career arc yeah so outside of that career i know you have some individual passions as well and (laughs) you can go ahead and drink that cup of water (laughs) okay so people can't see that that's going on so Mm. but of course now they know okay but um but yeah, there's some things you 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 have a connection with the healing arts in in New Mexico, right? I pract- I've had a sort of a long longish on offish mindfulness and insight meditation practice. So that it, you know ha- I've really r- relied on that as a resource in sort of you know navigating the the life changes that. A career, you know, dramatic uh, career change, you know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. compel you to use whatever you've got in your resilience toolkit. So I have that. And then I have a movement practice that I sometimes like to refer to as, as mindfulness in motion. It's kind of a, com- it's called Nia, and it's a combination of sort of, a, a, you know, just to really reduce it down to, uh, you know, it's kind of a combination of aerobic dance meets yoga philosophy type, you know, so it's, it's the reason I gravitated towards it was I used to have a yoga practice and then I would see, see these people um, at, in the studio, you know, wait while waiting for the yoga to begin, I could see these people dancing around and um you know (laughs) emerging from the studio being you know just beaming you know completely drenched with sweat and with the you know the most genuine and brightest smiles on their face and um you know they were obviously having a lot more fun than 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 i was in yoga and (laughs) 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 nothing again nothing against yoga it's just my 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 type would rather do something more dynamic and more fun and with loud good music playing you know dancing around rather than holding you know rigorous poses for you know i'd rather move so uh, that practice has also been another you know important thing in my toolkit and 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 it marries well with the uh, mindfulness practice. So mm. it, that's something that I read and think about. I listen to a lot of you know, uh, podcasts and um, guided meditations, you know, about mindfulness. And um, so that's that. That's there's that. I mean, I've got a lot of other things going on too. I have two teenage sons, so um, parenting is a big, you know, uh, important <laughs> aspect of my life. Oh, sure. uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, you know. Uh, Every everybody is now you know everybody with kids in school is now you know worried about the same 
thing like what happens in august and september yeah. and, and so you yeah. know that's it's pretty fraught and uh you know i'm a big sports fan but there are no sports you know being played right now um I'm one of the people that w- watches the old you know 2009 NBA Finals Game Six. You know, <laughs> I can I can watch that. I'm de- I'm a, I'm desperate. Um, so <laughs> yeah. Well, that's good. I mean, yeah, that's one of the advantages of everything being recorded. I mean, it's like podcasts. Podcasts yeah, yeah. do live on forever. Yeah. So, so. Uh, so so part of the reason I wanted to bring you on is because you know what does have my attention. Actually, I was talking to a a woman the other day that. Um, well, basically, she helps people get started writing their own book. Uh-huh. And, uh huh. And you know, and so I thought, hey, you know, Dave knows a whole lot about writing, and uh, it would just be fun to have you on and and talk about you know some of the things that you know. You know, I don't want to use the word tips, but advice about you know if you wanted to write. I mean, what becomes a how do you you know what is a good writer? What are the qualities of a good writer? I mean, how do we know that that uh, we could possibly take something that you might be able to tell us here and kind of integrate it into our own um, craft. That's what yeah. You well, to stop yeah, it, it is a craft, right? I mean, it really is. Totally. I mean, people think of it as uh, it's like anything else. I mean, if you you know before you can play the guitar at all, um, you think it's just some sort of magic trick or something that you know mm-hmm. you know. So, but then you learn uh, uh, that you know. Then I I learned to play the guitar and. Um, and write songs and I realized you know you really like three or four chords is all you really need it's not really magic I mean for the kind of music I like that's yeah it's gonna be enough and <laughs> so, yeah. so you know and there the, you know the the chord changes are one four and five and you know you might throw in a seventh or a minor every once in a while so yeah. you know it's like it's an analogy that you know, you could, anything that, you know, seems the product of inspiration and talent and, you know, whatever, uh, the, you know, the components of magic, well, they actually you break them down and there's a, just, there's craftsmanship at the base of it. And, and then, you know, the people that are, you know, are develop can develop mastery, you know, but it starts with craft craftsmanship and even the master's rely on a high degree of craftsmanship um you know because it's work i sometimes i you know analogize it to building a a craftsman building a really sturdy piece of furniture um you know like you want that thing to be have structural integrity first of all Mm -hmm. um Mm -hmm. and um and then uh, then you can start to add aesthetic considerations that might eventually elevate it to the level of, you know, art, but, or, you know, but, you know, it's a, but that's a big continuum and it always starts with the structural integrity of the piece of furniture because you don't want to, you don't want a beautiful table that you can't set a glass down on because it'll slide off, you know, so. Well, yeah, kind of. <laughs> Exactly. So what I'm thinking is I have a actually a good friend of mine, I think still lives in Santa Fe and he's a Finnish carpenter. So that's, you know, it's like he puts the finishing touches on, you know, a good solid, um, you know, he designs them, but, but somebody else may bring in the cabinetry for like a, a yeah. kitchen or something. Yeah. But he's the guy that comes in and uh-huh. finishes it off and puts all the shiny, you know, not shiny, but he, he, he finishes the finishing it off. Finishing details. In a, in, well, in a Santa Fe style, actually, yeah. is what he does. So that's so funny. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So when editing a magazine article, um, uh-huh. I used to actually use those that terminology. Um, no, really. Was no. F- a sort of the fit and finish. When you actually get now, you know, the article has been edited. It's been now. It's been laid out. The photo- the photos have been laid in. The headlines have been written, and um, and now it's time to actually you know make sure that the spacing between the words is right and you don't have you know widows dangling off the end of paragraphs mm-hmm. and you don't have mm-hmm. bad breaks where you have a, a hyphen in the middle of a word that's under the last word on the page so you have to turn the page to see the second you know half of the word you know just real detailed fit and finish <laughs> so yeah. that's a very that's something that you know we'll probably get to this but you know that's something that's kind of 
I feel like, you know, a, a 19th century plasterer, you know, that's, you know, there's, there's not much demand for the fit and finish of the print, uh, you know, of the magazine editor anymore. I mean, it's just like, look, I'm, I'm a career magazine guy and I barely read magazines anymore. So I'm going to cop to that right now. I'm not going to just sit here and bemoan and, you know, the demise of an industry that I don't, you know, even you know, materially support, you know, myself these days very much. But uh, before we move on to whatever the next publishing technology is and however it happens, you know, I wouldn't mind taking a moment to, you know, <laughs> dwell on and be a little nostalgic for the 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 art of putting putting together, you know, well uh, written, well designed, well photographed, copy edited, fact checked, you know, pieces of work that are time, labor, and and resource intensive. That just doesn't seem to be that much. It's not just not happening much anymore, and it's yeah. probably not going to come back. You know, except for, you know, it, it, like I said, in new ways that are just still emerging. Um, mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. you know, right now we're at a historic crux uh you know inflection point of you know the decline of that industry has been ongoing has been cratering for at least a decade you know decade and a half um but now this could be the final nail in the coffin if the combination of the economic downturn and then the shift uh in in uh, communications technologies um you know and platforms just means something else is happening now and we it's probably still pretty unclear what it is mm-hmm mm-hmm one thing it is is a you know is a you know the it's get, it kind of gives rise to the podcast industry which is exploding exactly. you know which is you know something that's exploding you know f kind of filling a vacuum maybe of uh, where you know magazines used to carry on these thoughtful conversations about you know ideas and yeah. personalities and you know the times uh, so. I mean, when was the last time you heard anybody say, "Hey, did you read that article in Esquire?" I I haven't heard that in years, and right. and and it, yeah. and it, and it used to be all the time, you yeah. know, you know. Yeah. So anyway, um, probably jumping ahead of the game, and I'm not answering your question yet about what makes uh, what makes a a good writer. <laughs> um, but well, I, it's a pretty big question. I'm yeah. Sure. Okay. So, but um, you know, I I have tips <laughs> I've, I've practiced this I've thought about a lot of, and one thing I even remembered when I was kind of preparing was that I actually taught a course at NYU one semester in the journalism school about sort of the art of uh, you know nonfiction writing um, so I, I think that no matter where you're starting and I've said this to I've said this in many a meeting with many an editor or many a writer the first question you have to ask is, who cares? <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. You know, I mean, <laughs> what, what, you know, what do you actually have to say? Who's, who's the audience? <laughs> um, is there an audience? Is there an audience? Exactly. Is there an audience for this? Um, yeah. And, or and is it the audience of say out either if you're working for a publication or some outlet you know is it our audience, um, and um, and you know t these days any idea you know start to beg the question what's what's the platform you know because of what I was just talking about there's not like yep. there's a million magazines out there or even local newspapers anymore that have the resources to print a lot of stuff and and. So then the, the platforms become, uh, it becomes a big question. What are you going to do with your idea or your information or your whatever you're trying to accomplish with the piece of writing? So one of the important things, once you figure out who's, who the audience is, you're also talking about what the motivation is and what the what's the mission of this article. And... And then you want to be have it almost down to reduce it to something like an elevator pitch. Like this article is about that blah, blah blah for the benefit of blah blah blah. You know, you you know, and then yeah. Um, so the um, that's the story in a nutshell. And um, 
I'm going to talk a lot in terms of sort of article type of writing, but a lot of these uh, tips apply to other types of writing too. Mm -hmm. But, Mm -hmm. you know, so that, that nutshell, there's this, you know, in feature writing, feature journalism, magazine writing, there's something called a nut paragraph. You ever heard of a nut paragraph? I've never heard of that. Okay. So, I, I would guarantee you that probably at least ninety percent of the articles that you have read in in a you know a magazine um, that were you know over fifteen hundred words long had something called a nut paragraph, and it's in the probably buried in the first four hundred words of the introduction, and mm-hmm. um, and it's it is it's simply that it's a paragraph that says the story in a nutshell this is about so however whatever you did in terms of your lead and your you know to try to grab the reader's attention and get them to you know come on this journey with you whether you set a scene or you have some news to impart or you have um you know a character sketch or some just crazy quotes or whatever it is that you use to start the article with after about 300 words you're going to see something where it says, and you know, in so many words says, and this story is going to be about the blah, 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 and why this all means anything and what it, what it indicates and sets up the entire rest of the story. And then the, then the introduction. Yeah, so it sounds like it sets it up for people to continue. Yeah. It's like, it's the why, it's the what's in it for me. I always like saying my, yeah. my, my radio, radio station WIFM, what's in it for me? Um, again, that goes back to the who cares. You always have to yeah. think about what's in it for the reader. And, yeah. and you have to take them, you know, by the hand, even if they don't even know they're being taken by the hand because you mm-hmm. you kind of, um, you know, you're spelling it out there. You know, there's there's a 150 word paragraph here in the introduction of the article that stops setting a scene and stops, ta- you know, doing a character sketch and stops this quotation and says, just backs off to 30,000 feet and says, this is what this is going to be all about. Look for that, the next magazine article that you read and see if you're not right. I mean, I I, I had a, write, a young writer, very talented but inexperienced writing a feature for me once and and he was his introduction was not really going any place he was starting with a a character and and then not creating this the sort of bridge to the body of the story and i said you mm-hmm. know i i basically just googled you know i just hit up newyorker.com went on to the you know the lead story on there that day you know and it was by a very prominent nonfiction journal called John Lee Anderson and it was exactly that he was writing about starting with this a character sketch of some guy in Cuba and 400 words into it then he said this is why you know we're talking about this you know (laughs) this guy this way and then its story takes off from there and becomes like much broader story than just this character sketch and quotes by this one individual that the 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 journalist had decided to spotlight in the lead so that leads to the second tip once you figured all that stuff out like who cares what's the platform then how are you going to how are you going to tell it so you know you have a story to tell and information to deliver let's say or and ideas to deliver Um, Mm -hmm. and so how do you organize that? I cannot tell you how many times I have said to professional writers who are in the middle of their career or, or more, (laughs) (laughs) did you do an outline? Do I mean, if you're, (laughs) (laughs) yeah. yeah, do an outline just like your sixth grade teacher taught you to do it, do it. Yeah. Um, because you got to organize, you know, if you just start trying to write without having your ducks in a row, you're going to flail or you're just going to make your life much harder than it needs to be. So I, I do that all the time. And you know, when I'm, when I have a writing project, I get, like the biggest pieces of copier paper that I can get. 
like 11, 17, I, what's, what's north of 11 by 17, whatever I can, you know, and, yeah. and then I'll start sketching out the scenes, quotes, characters, information, da, da, all the um, elements of the story. And then I'll start connecting the dots. I mean, li- literally drawing arrows from, you know, this goes with that and that goes with this. And so, so you're, that's the sort of the creative process of, pattern recognition you know you're you're yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. you know you're you know there is a f- if, if anybody who's hearing this is interested the most fascinating example of this and it actually is a lot like what i wound up doing is um gay Talese wrote a famous magazine article called frank sinatra has a cold and and if you just google you know gay Talese Sinatra, it pops up. Talese, you know, was a uh, you know famously kind of you know wore really well tailored clothes. I think his father was a tailor, so maybe this is where this you know my my craftsman metaphor even clicks in there. He used the cardboard um, inserts to his pressed shirts as his um, as his eleven by seventeen uh, copier paper. And drew like these story maps, you know, they're outlines, but they're also maps with, like I said, like arrows going off and like using different colored pens and, you know, you know, writing signals, you know, reminders to himself about the story elements that he wants to highlight. And, and, and it's just fascinating, you know, maybe more fascinating to someone who's in the business, but to see the him applying this the sixth grade rule of do an outline to what has become one of the most famous magazine profiles ever written. <laughs> and it's still, like I said, you, you, if you Google that, you'll find a lot of hits on that. And a lot of, you know, you can, a lot of articles about it. And it's just a famous thing, but um, Hey, if it's good enough for gay to lease, it's good enough for me. And I've done it millions of times. Um, I, I'll do it, you know, any project I have, basically, I, I'm getting it. I'm getting uh, it, and yeah. I, I want to remind people that are listening that is that uh, I'm going to do the best I can to kind of like uh, include all this in the show notes for the episode, yeah. including links to Gate to Lee's um, Frank Sinatra. Yeah, Frank Sinatra has a cold. Yeah, great, great, great story. So yeah, that's that's the really important part of the process that a lot of people just skip over, <laughs> or mm-hmm. or don't spend as much time. Uh, getting their elements aligned of their story um, uh-huh. but before they start writing. You know, it's a truism of editing and it's a truism of writing. The best editing takes place before the writer ever writes a word. You know, you've talked about the idea, you've, you've you know, from its, it basically from its inception through mm-hmm. the re- through reporting, through the writing, through the, you know, but whatever, you know, the, <laughs> getting out ahead of it and ha- having a clear idea of, what you're doing and how you're going to do it uh, before the writing ever starts. Uh, this is a great, you know, piece of uh, of advice because, you know, you've you probably heard the, you know, the quotation or I forget who said it, but it was probably a fiction writer. So this doesn't really apply, but it was, you know, there's, there's nothing to writing. You just put a piece of paper into the typewriter and stare at the blank page until beads of blood form on your forehead um, <laughs> I don't, I, I'm guessing that's not the way you like to do it. Well, if if you did the stuff that I I recommended in steps one and two, by the time you get to this writing phase, stage three, you're not going to have that problem because you've already kind of when you've been you analyzing all of the elements that you have in your in your story that while you were doing that you figured out what the the lead was you figured out what you know, you're you're already clear about what the nut is you have a sense of where the structure of the story is going to go now you're a craftsman putting the pieces together most people don't like to, to write most people like having written you know mm. because it's hard work mm. it's hard but just f- following the sort of the craftsman's approach to it will take you very far because many of the times that I have sat down to write 
something and I'm not feeling it. I don't have the right voice for this story yet. I'm not, it's not flowing. This is hard. This sucks. I suck. Um, nobody, you know, it's easy to go negative. But if you're a professional about it, if you take a professional approach to it, you just put the pieces together. And then you can worry about all the, you know, you're a long way from the fit and finish. You, but you got to get out, you know, if, if you're the carpenter, get out the best wood you have. Put it in a, you know, measure it, lay it out, you know, start building the the piece. Yeah, I got to tell you, I interrupt you for a minute, but what I'm doing internally as you're talking about this is what it's doing for me is like, I realize, oh, that, that just takes out a whole lot of confusion. Right. And then, right. Because you're so, you're essentially, you're sorting. You're sorting ideas. You're, assemb- you're, so- you're assembling. Yeah. Yes. Yes. A- and, and then you can either, you, you know, you can always come back and rewrite it and make it sing, you know, add the, you know, the fit and finish part. You're a long way from that. But yeah. uh, and I could also kind of also say many of the time that I felt like I was doing that, just try, trying to get, you know, put the ducks in a row and I'll, you know, it sucks and, mm-hmm. I'll, you know, and come back to it the next day and you go, hey, you know what? This ain't so bad, you know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, you know, that's the, you know, the where the rubber meets the road. Where you don't, you're not sitting around waiting for the muse. You're not waiting for inspiration. You're not waiting for the song to magically appear in your ears you're sitting down and you're building it and so how much should you do here's a great writing tip that the likes of um tom wolf and ernest hemingway both said the same thing so tom tom wolf had a quota a daily quota of a Mm -hmm. a thousand words a day Mm -hmm. and he would try to get it done before lunch and he would stop in the middle of a sentence, if that's where word 1000 was. <laughs> really? Yeah. No matter, no matter what kind of role he was on or, you know, yeah, you know, just stop because a, you've done, you've achieved your quota for today and now you can do whatever else you need to do today with, you know, the knowledge and confidence and satisfaction of having done your primary work. And when you pick up the next day, that's when you start to revise the stuff that you did the previous day, the thousand words that you did the previous day. You go back and you massage that and you, you know, you're already starting the rewrite process there. Then by the time you get to that 1000th word, you're already in the flow that you were in yesterday and you know where you're going to pick up and you know where you're going. So you're, it's not like you're coming back the next day and say, Oh crap, what do I do now? You have yeah, a, so you it's a, it's a, it sounds like a process of building up momentum to the next thousand words. Yes, when you go back when you go back that next day, you're like you're looking at it, you're grooming. It's it's putting you in the mindset of where you were, cleaning it up, and then you, you've got the momentum going, and then you just do the next thousand words. Hundred percent, and that's you know one of the lessons you always hear: write and rewrite and rewrite and rewrite. Well, for me, the rewriting that's where the rewriting happens. Um, uh-huh. because, uh, because it's I, really interesting. Yeah. It's not after I've done the article, I don't say, okay, I'm going to rewrite this sucker. I've been rewriting it the whole time. Yeah. So, you know, that introduction and those first thousand words and the second thousand words, those are, by the time I get to the, you know, end of the article, those are really polished. Those are really where I want them to be because mm-hmm. I've already done the rewriting work. Um, mm-hmm. in as part of the process of writing the mm-hmm. next chunk. I, I like it a lot. That is a very natural process for me. You know, just a real quick sideline is when I was like working and running a country inn and I was learning to cook. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like most people cook and they make a huge mess and then they do that. They present the dinner and then there's this big, huge cleanup. But what I learned to do was clean as I go. And actually it, it's like you would think it would de- detract from the creation, but not at all. Because when it's all said and done and the plates go out, you turn around and look and it's just clean. I mean, it's just clean. So, right. and, and I've been writing myself lately for new website content. And this is what you're talking about is exactly what it, it's totally in alignment with me. I don't, I'm not counting a thousand words. Yeah, right. But, but I you am don't stopping. Have, yeah. Yeah. I am stopping in the next day or later on in the day. I go back and start, you know, start 
just look at it from with fresh eyes, right? And then and then gain the momentum and pick up and continue. Yeah, that's so. Great, Dave. And, and so the the beauty of this process mm-hmm. <laughs> is you don't have to be the most talented writer in the world to be a successful writer. It it, it talent well, that is, makes that sounds good to me. Uh, uh, talent is wildly overrated because again, it goes back to what I was saying about before you learn to play four card, you know, four chord progression on a guitar. It seems like every song is magic, but then you realize it's yeah. just, they're all built on the same four chords and they're pretty much the same order. Um, yeah, and um, this same thing with writing. I've known a lot of perfectly successful writers who have had long careers uh, who are not. You know, talent is the, is not their main thing. Like mm-hmm. they're 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 professional. They're skilled. They're mm. you know they're they do things that professionals do in any field. They have you know they have craft and they have you know discipline and 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 that will it, it carry the day. You know, for a lot of people, better than somebody who just is relying on talent is not putting in the hard work of reporting and research and all that stuff that you know, I didn't even talk about in the process of writing yet, but it kind of goes without saying, you know, mm-hmm. you have to have something to say and you should have, you know, you know, if you're doing nonfiction, you should have data to back it up. So yeah. And then this is a personal taste for me, but what you know, when it comes to the ending, as much as I've said about mapping the whole story out, unless I just have a, like a killer quote or a killer scene or something obvious that's going to be like the great ending, I kind of let the ending reveal itself because after the, you know, I've written 2,500 words on this thing over the f- course of a f- few days, um, mm-hmm. I, I, like to ha- I like to surprise myself with the ending. I like it when stories have a kind of an unexpected conclusion. You know, does the end kind of write itself? Is that what it you're kind saying? Of, I, I, it, this is a personal thing, and I'm not saying that sure. this is um, sure necessarily a piece of advice, but just in terms of my own process, I'm saying I just don't script the whole thing before unless I unless, like I said, there's just something like there's just some killer quote or something. If you're doing a profile right. of somebody and they're like, you know, it's writes itself. You know, you, that's going to be yeah. the ending, but. Anyway, that's the, that can be the fun part, surprising yourself with the ending. But yeah. um, anyway, those are the my like. You asked me to like boil down my t- writing tips. Um, that's about three tried and true ones that I've picked up over the years and used myself. I use them myself anytime I have an assignment like that. So there's other things that can really contribute to. You know, sort of in the bonus tips, you know, category of uh, I've had the, you know, the good fortune to work with a lot of good editors. <laughs> now, mm-hmm. that's a, you know, it's really good to enter the editing process with a lot of humility because a good editor can really elevate your work and save you from embarrassment and mistakes. Mm-hmm. Um, so, mm-hmm. and, but, you know, it's just good to get feedback from people that you trust, um, no matter, no matter what. You know, you might yeah, feedback's pretty important. Yeah, uh, who, I I heard some podcast. I wish I could reference it, but uh, very successful writer, and he said he would always, always send his uh, manuscripts in different stages to his mother to read. <laughs> yeah, he, because he totally yeah. trusted her and knew that she would be honest and give him valuable feedback. Great. Well, it's great to have, you know, anyone that can can fulfill that role for you. Another great thing to do, which I don't do enough, but is really smart is to read things out loud. Read your own writing oh. out loud because you'll catch wrong word choices or awkward phrasings or mm-hmm. run on sentences or stuff maybe even it doesn't make sense. It's a really good idea to read your stuff out loud and sort of hear it um, while you're doing that. Can I, can I ask a question? Because yeah. It, uh, I, I mean, I have a lot of assumptions in my head, so I want to see if we can break this one up, which is the written word and spoken word are really two different things. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they are and they aren't. <laughs> okay, Dave, you're going to have to explain that. <laughs> I mean, I really gravitate towards writers whose 
voice, whose writing voice mm-hmm. feels intimate enough and, and, and real enough in print to almost sound like a spoken voice. You know, obviously it's more crafted. And, and, mm-hmm. but, but so, but one of the things that you subconsciously or consciously appreciate about good writing is it just feels like you're, somebody's telling you a story, you know, I mean, it's the oldest, yeah. you know, one of the oldest human instincts, you know? Yeah. They're in your head. You're reading it and they're just like in your yeah. head. Yeah. You know, there's some other benefits of it, depending on what you're going to do with your writing. You know, if you're going to, um, uh, read an essay as an introduction to a podcast or if you were going to sometimes if you write something that you know anybody that resonates with people or you have or you're in a position you might wind up doing some public speaking well it's 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 good to have practice Mm -hmm. saying your words out loud um Mm -hmm. and learning to recognize what kind of you know writing doesn't translate to oral mm-hmm. transmission, and then that should make you re- re-examine your, your written word choices, too, and see if they're really standing up in print, apparently, or maybe not standing up, uh, you know, as spoken word right now. So, Yeah, one, one thing I wanted to mention is a um, little plug promoting podcasting is I tell people a lot, depending on who it is, but I say, you want to do public speaking? Starting a podcast and doing it is a fabulous way to get into the into the public speaking venues because mainly because you're you're practicing constantly like you right. and I are having see the voice I have now I did not have when I started podcasting so my voice had a tendency to be really high and I talked faster and, all, and, and it was just a completely different voice uh-huh. but now it's like I use my voice as a way to kind of influence the story right and anything that I might be saying yes and I do have, I do know that I do have a tendency to have a hypnotic um, linguistic pattern. Right. These aren't the droids you're looking for, kind of thing. Yeah. But, <laughs> but uh, still, you know, I, I use pod, I've used podcasting, you know, to develop my voice for speaking. Yeah. So we're talking about cultivating and honing language communication skills <laughs> mm-hmm. you know whether yeah. whether it's written or spoken or some hybrid of written and spoken like broadcast or podcast or something so yeah, yeah, yeah. these are all these are basic communications skills that uh, i guess a lot of people probably don't you know, just think it either you have the talent for it or you don't, or you went to school for it and you took the right courses or whatever. Yeah, um, yeah. But it's, it's, there's plenty of sources of information about how to do everything now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I know. So that, you know, so I think D- that DYI, do it yourself. Right. right. So, yeah, it's all, it's, it kind of comes down to um, the same you know, root thing. How do we share, how do we share information clearly mm-hmm. and in a way that's, you know, attractive, palatable, makes you want to keep listening. Um, mm-hmm. Make, mm-hmm. you know, you learn something from it, you know, and, uh, um, and, and maybe it demystifies, you know, fields that you haven't done before to learn that, you know, the basics of the craft that, you know, even the masters <laughs> rely upon. Um, so, yeah. yeah, that's great. Did you have any particular stories you'd like to tell in terms of a project that you might have taken on that uh, that was either maybe challenging and or gratifying or all of the above or just s- some story? Think of a time in your career of writing that was really a defining moment for you when kind of everything changed. Mm. And it may have been a mm. project, but maybe it was a decision you made and you took some action and uh, yeah, you're smiling. They can't see it, but you got it. That's it. That's what I want. That's that's what you should talk about. No, this is me being puzzled. Um, <laughs> you're, you're, when you're puzzled, you smile. <laughs> that's that's nervous. That's good. Then that was nervous laughter. Yeah. No, I can't think. Um, up, you know, immediately after we sign off, I'll probably think of uh, something that you know I should have said in the. Uh, the, the the French call the esprit d'escalier, the thing you think of, you know, you're walking down the stairs after the dinner yeah. party. But, um, you know, I, 
you know, I'm thinking of, you know, since we're talking about craft, um, mm-hmm. I, you know, there's a couple of stories where I was, you know, that I had that are actually on my website. So anybody that really gets nerdy on this could actually refer to those stories and see what I'm talking about. One of them, and they, and they presented two different challenges. One of them was a story about Ted Turner's ranches in New Mexico, which he was opening up for um, ecotourism. And, you know, obviously the selling point of that article is Ted Turner. It's, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and getting access to somebody like Ted Turner is not always easy, right? Um, <laughs> I mean, it helped that he had a PR company that was trying to get publicity for these eco ranches, and I was the editor of the state magazine, um, so I had I did gain some access. Nice, um, but uh, but it I mean, as far as FaceTime with Ted himself, it was very narrowly circumscribed. I said they were you know you got twenty minutes, and. Ted was, uh, okay, so this is probably five years ago. Ted was, appeared to me to be declining and, you, mm-hmm. let, you know, some dementia or whatever. He was um, in his, uh, five years ago, he was probably just entering his 70s. Or was late 70s. Right? Late 70s. Oh, late 70s. Yeah, he okay. was 78 or something at the time. Uh-huh. And, and he was, he, you know, Nobody was nobody talking about it. Nobody was hadn't wasn't in the paper that Ted, you know, had dementia or Alzheimer's or whatever he had or has. But he was rambling. He was, um, you know, not responding directly to my direct questions. And the you know the clock is ticking um, on my twenty minutes, and. I'm trying to get him to talk about his ranches in New Mexico and he's talking about you know sailing around the Cape of Good Horn and the bat, you know the battling the seas and all that you know he's just he's just way off topic got it and so I had to try to keep ro- roping him in as politely obviously as I could you don't want to piss off Ted Turner and you know be rude to him um but you're trying to get your job done because I had prepared well for this interview and I had done a ton of reporting and reading and researching. I kind of had knew all those things that I talked about before. Like I almost, I basically had the storyboard written already, (laughs) you know? And, and I just needed some quotes from Ted to, to bring in the Ted factor. You know, he's the, he's the, you know, he's the star of the show. He's um, the man. Um, yep. And so what I was able to do, because I had done so much other work on this piece, was take pretty scant, you know, if I typed up my quotes from that interview, I didn't have a ton to work with. But I had enough, like, one-liners that were speaking to chunks and themes about my article that I could sprinkle them in and deploy them, you know, sort of strategically. So it, to the reader, it looked like I spent two days riding around, you know, Ted's enormous ranches in Southern New Mexico, talking about conservation and his bird watching escapades with Jimmy Carter and, you know, all that stuff. So it just in terms of craft, because I had done all that other stuff, I was able to take, you know, sort of limited resources of, you know, useful FaceTime with Ted and make it sound like I had a lot of quality time with him and that he was a voice that was guiding this story too, you know, so that's just, that's just a, you know, a piece of, you know, kind of professionalism, right? I mean, you're, yeah, you know, yeah, but totally worked, I'm, you know, I won a gold award for that story and it's a really interesting Very nice. piece, and um, so I had a, you know I had another article where uh, I had the almost the opposite problem. 
because I had had such good access to such a rich experience that I had to be real selective about how I told this story. It was about a musician in Belize um, named Andy Palacio, and um, he had one of the most successful world music albums of all time. It's probably still among the top 10, even though this was in the, you know, the aughts. And he was a, he had been recognized as a United Nation artist for peace and a, you know, he practically had the Nobel Prize for doing, you know, this cultural preservation project. You know, he's mm-hmm. a, he was a uh, member of the Garifuna people who are kind of a very, um, minority population around the Caribbean rim of Central America, so Belize, Honduras, Nicaragua. And uh, he made this incredibly successful album. You know, he won the the World Music Golden Globe. Do you remember the name of the album? Uh, yeah, it's called, it's called Watina. Watina. Watina, W-A-T-I-N-A. And I was, you know, this was when I was at Caribbean Travel and Life, and I was able to go, I was invited to go on what was a, a, a mini junket kind of, which was a tour of Belize with with Andy and his band as they mm. as they uh went from town to town um and it was kind of a um it was after he had gotten some big you know u n award or something. i mean i think I, there was even a scene in this thing where he was so he was going back to his hometown, which was a little village that you, you know, you fly to mm-hmm. southern, fly to Belize City, then you fly to southern Belize, then you get on a boat for, that goes, on, you know, in, into a little village. And, mm-hmm. and you know, then at, there at the dock, there's, you know, all these women, um, sort of middle-aged uh, women in very cr- kind of Creole, you know, madras dresses and, and stuff and really authentic afro-caribbean stuff and you know and they're ululating as he as the boat approaches and then he gets marched in to the ceremony and his and his cousin who's like the minister of culture you know makes a speech and gives him an award and then on and on the week was you know there was a big con a big outdoor concert uh and it coincided with belizean like uh garifuna independence day or something the day that they landed on the shores of Belize after having been exiled from St. Vincent hundreds of years ago. So there was this huge cultural celebration going on. Of of course, he was the focal point of it. Uh, There was a, we went back to the village where he recorded Watina, his producer was with us. And, uh, you know, they had recorded it in some little, literally like a bamboo shack. And, um, and then there was this funky little tropical bar, and they played there. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was free, of course. And it was one of the most intense concerts I've ever been to in the lifetime of going to intense concerts. So it was it was just this incredible magical mystery tour of of, of Belize and and you know being able to really witness their culture you know at its apogee right he was this was a you know this was a celebration of the whole culture that and our native son has become this big international star and is recognized by the un and number one world music album in the world and and he was very personable and very humble dude you know he was uh very much you know on the socialist you know i'm not a I'm not a star. I'm not a pop star. I'm a cultural worker. You know, uh, I, I speak for my people, not for myself. You know, I'm the. He was great guy. I was, I was talking to another journalist on this thing, and after this concert, these two concerts we saw, we were saying, you know, this is like seeing, you know, Fela Kuti and you know, or Bob Marley, you know, in their hometown that they yeah. grew up in, yeah. you know. <laughs> It was, yeah. it felt exactly what it felt like, you know, sort of these populist third world people who had a will, a, you know, whatever it took to get their message out to the world. So while I was writing that story, I got an email that from his record company that said Andy had a heart attack and stroke and, you know, 
they airlifted him from Belize to Canada or something and hoping for the best. But anyway, he died. And, mm-hmm. and he was 47 years old. I mean, yeah, you know, on, on top of the world and had just taken this big victory lap. Well, that concert that I saw in that little grass, you know, in that little tropical shack was the last Andy Palacio concert ever. Wow. And so <laughs> then my writing project, <laughs> you know, had the, the stakes raised on it quite a bit. First of all, I was emotionally distraught by the whole thing because mm-hmm. I, I really admired him and had gotten to know him. And I, I'm sure if I, you know, after this podcast, if I go and put on Watina, I'll probably get a little choked up. I, it's still, sure. you know, I mean, this is 15 years ago or something or sure. 13, whatever it was. So the stakes got raised on that story a lot because now it was dramatic it was poignant it and was you're right you're writing the legacy piece it's like i feel a big responsibility to represent him and his mission to give it its full you know airing and and give it its full you know respect because it's like this is a this is now a historic moment at least as mm-hmm. far as people in belize and people that care about that music and you know, all concerned. I mean, you know, their hero died <laughs> there you know, that, right when he was on the top of the mountain. So, but you know, the other, you know, piece of, I realized now I have, you know, now drama is a big element of this story and it wasn't before it was just a celebration. Now it's a eulogy too. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so then I had all this, you know, material every day was so ridiculously rich and all these great scenes and, and so, and so then just putting that story together, the opposite problem, of, you know, the opposite issue of the Ted Turner thing, which was a piece of professionalism where I deployed quotes, you know, strategically to make it look like I'd had a lot more access than I had. This one, this one I had unbelievable access and, and, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. then I had to be super selective about, you know, how I told this story. So... Both those stories are on my website. I chose to talk about them because anybody that cares could read them and see what I'm talking about. You know, when I think about like the, probably the most impactful story I ever wrote, and I'm not talking about anything like uh, clicks, you know, or likes. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Uh, uh, you know, I'm just talking about emotional impact and mm-hmm. um, and and you know the just the the heaviness of the content itself. I mean, that was a story that I would point to and say, you know, that could be the, you know, the best story I wrote. I'd be amiss if I defined your own defining moment. But I would say this is it sounds to me very much like what what uh, changed for you or what you actually had to rise to was writer's responsibility. Yeah. Like you said, shifted from celebration to eulogy. That's that's. It's not even 180 degrees the opposite direction. It's just a completely whole new thing. Well, I mean, it had to be both is what it was, you know. I mean, there's a, um, if anybody cares to read it, I don't know. It's My website is herndonatlarge.com. So that is the website, and each word is hyphenated. So yeah. it's H-E-R-N-D-O-N hyphen at A-T hyphen large, L-A-R-G-E. Dot com. Right. Both of the stories are on there. Um, and, uh, yeah. And so you're available for uh, freelance work? I am available for freelance work. And, um, like I said, I'm doing coaching now and helping. Like, I have a friend who's uh, hired me to help him write his book um, about his career in the restaurant business. And it's a ha- sort of a how-to book about the mm-hmm. restaurant business. Uh, I'm helping him. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm working with other Another client who's on a different, completely different kind of helping to edit her teaching manuals for her, um, for the NIA practice that I referred to either earlier. Mm-hmm. The, the founder of NIA is re, uh, revisiting, relaunching um, her teaching materials and her marketing materials. So I'm um, ed- editing her stuff. And, uh, you know, so I'm a, I'm a, I'm a wordsmith for hire is what I am. <laughs> yeah, so I'm going to 
I know. Yeah, it's, it's exciting to me. It's so I'm going to give out your email address if that's okay. Is that all right? Sure. So right off your website, it basically is, uh, it's at the top along with your phone number, which I won't give out, but it's herndon at large at gmail.com. So am I not pronouncing your last name correctly? Yeah, it's Herndon. Herndon. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But at least it's clear the way you're saying it. Yeah. Herndon. <laughs> <laughs> yep, it is. You know what, my friend? This is the beginning. I think this is the beginning of a couple different episodes because I'd like to hear the stories about your trip to Africa. And you know, Wow, you've just done so much. I mean, once again, when you go to the website, there's work and life link, right? So, yeah, there's all the magazine covers and everything else. It's incredible. Do I see a picture of Clint Eastwood? I think I do. I think Clint was probably on the cover of Men's Journal where yep, I ha ha had an article in that issue or something. Yeah. No, it's great. Yeah, it's really great. Dave, thanks for being here. Let's do this again. Okay. Happy to. I'm enjoying it. Yes. And uh, hug a choya for me, would you? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. No. Most people don't know what a choya is, I'll bet. <laughs> Do you want to tell them or you want me to? Uh, it's a cactus. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Very spiny cock cactus at that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, quite beautiful blossoms, some of the which are coming out at this time of year. But yeah. Yeah. Well, it's a favorite time of year, I remember, because just, you know, I was there 24 years, most of my adult life. And uh, when I first got there, it's just like, God, this place is brown. But... Then August came, monsoons came, and I'm driving from Santa Fe to Albuquerque or maybe the other way around, and it's like there's the brown desert, and then there's the monsoon, and, you know, it's like it's beautiful, it's clear, it's like 75, 80, 85, something like that, and it's like the clouds come in, the monsoon dumps, 20 minutes later or less, it's gone, and then I had to pull over because the desert absolutely exploded in color. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, well, I know. Yeah, it's uh, it's beautiful here, and um, there's a lot of different microclimates. Um, so you can have the you know the the choya in the desert, and then you can half an hour you can be, you know, in a ponderosa pine forest. Um, yeah, you know. So <laughs> yeah, it's beautiful. Aspens, a aspens, and uh, lots of chamisa. Yeah, uh, yeah. The the vegetation, you know. Y yeah, I mean, you have to look past that brown filter that mm. a lot, you know, that, you know, sometimes, you know, it, when there's a drought, uh, it does get a little bit oppressive. But um, all in all, beautiful place to be with lots of intact, uh, sort of rugged, natural beauty of in a variety of shapes and colors. Yeah, an awesome <laughs> green chili from Hatch, New Mexico. Right. The cuisine is, uh, you know, the the everyday sort of New Mexican cuisine is super high level of tastiness. Um, yeah, no kidding. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's not found anywhere else that, I've, that I know of. Right. Uh, but yeah. you know what? That's another episode. So let's wind this up. And uh, once again, I want to thank you for being here. Thank you, John. Real pleasure. Yeah. Talk soon. Right on. This podcast can be found on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. If you like the episode, I would encourage you to tell a friend and just let them know about it, especially those people that are trying to learn to write. You might be doing them a really, really big favor.